We start the meditation every evening with thoughts of goodwill. To remind ourselves of why we're here. We have goodwill for ourselves and that we're looking for true happiness. We have goodwill for others in the sense that we don't want our happiness to cause them suffering. That's why we're looking inside. And it's important to remember both dimensions of the practice, the good we're doing for ourselves and the good we're doing for others. Because otherwise, especially if you focus simply on what we're doing for ourselves, it gets self-indulgent, narcissistic, self-centered. We miss out on the other dimension, that we're here to find a happiness that's harmless. And not just harmless. We actively try to do good for other beings, too, other people, other animals, wherever we see their suffering, without exceptions. The only exceptions are the people that we can't help. This is the difference between goodwill and generosity. Goodwill can be extended to all. But our actual generosity has its limits. In terms of what we can afford, we only have so much money, so much time, so much knowledge. We don't have an infinite fund. And we have to make sure that our fund stays nourished inside. Otherwise, our goodness, as in, as in the Thai phrase, our goodness breaks down. Just can't keep it up. So we focus on the breath, train the mind to find a sense of well-being inside. That's a way of keeping ourselves nourished. Because when you think about all the selfishness, all the cruelty, all the stupidity in the world, especially when people have very narrow ideas of who they want to help and who they don't want to help, whom they feel empathy for and whom they feel no empathy for, you realize it's because they themselves feel threatened. Their source of happiness is something that is very insecure. And most people don't even think very carefully about where their happiness lies. You think that would be one of the most important things to focus on in life. Well, where is your happiness based? Be very clear about that. But everybody seems to be distracted and easily misled. And so they have a vague sense that their happiness is threatened, but they don't know. I really stop to take stock of where does their happiness lie. And that vague sense of threat can just get focused on who knows what, all kinds of crazy things, crazy ideas. But you find that when you place the source of your happiness inside and cultivate this, There's much less of a sense of threat, and it's a lot easier to see all beings in common. Some of the forest Johns talk about how they go out in the forest and they feel really afraid of the animals in the forest. And it's only when they gain a sense of solidity in their meditation that they begin to see that the animals in the forest, they're afraid too. They're suffering, too. And so the greater your inner security, the greater your, the greater your goodness, your potential for goodness, your potential for help, your potential for empathy. So this practice of meditation is not selfish. It's taking care of the source of your goodness, making sure it stays nourished. 
so that you have more to give and you're more clear-sighted in what you have to give or about what you have to give and where you want to give it. That's what's special about this happiness that's found inside. It's not only harmless, it's also clear-sighted. It's not like the happiness of the world where you have to be really deluded in order to enjoy a lot of things. And the more you enjoy them, the more deluded you get. The happiness from meditation is a happiness that requires that you be clear-sighted. You have to understand what's going on in the mind. On the one hand, there are the people who find it difficult for the mind to settle down, so it takes a lot of understanding. You see, what are the stages to get your mind to settle down? Where is the object? What is the object? That provides you with a sense of ease, that enables the mind finally to gain a sense of rest. Then there are the people for whom concentration is very easy. They sit for a while and boom, they go down. Their problem, though, of course, is when they begin to realize that it doesn't always work. In that case, they have to figure out okay, why is it that it works sometimes and not other times. So either way, for the mind to find a reliable sense of happiness inside requires that you understand the mind. The way it picks up a mood, the way it picks up an idea, often without your being aware of it. And then that mood or that idea begins eating away at you. So just to get the mind still and to make that stillness reliable, you have to understand a lot about the mind. This is why this happiness requires that you be clear-sighted. This is why the Buddha said that the, the happiness that comes from jhana is a happiness without blame, both in the sense of not harming anyone and in the sense of not intoxicating the mind, or at least not blurring the mind and making it deluded. And it's nourishment. That simple ability to sit with your eyes closed for a while and be very still and gain a sense of fullness in the body, fullness in mind. That can nourish you in all kinds of situations. And it's free. It's available to everybody who has a breath. It's simply a matter of learning to give the time and being observant. Because that's where a lot of the best things in life come from. Not things you buy, not things that you can simply pick up simply from the fact you have money or have connections. This is a skill that requires simply that you want to master the skill and that you put in the time and that you're observant. Those four bases for success, the desire to do it, persistence, giving it full attention, and being circumspect in what you do. In other words, noticing what's working, noticing what's not working using your ingenuity to figure out new ways, new possibilities, new angles from which to approach the practice. These are all the qualities you need. They're qualities that everybody has in potential form. So it's a good happiness. It's not restricted only to people who have money or only people who are smart or only people who have a particular background. It's there for anybody who wants it and is willing to give the time. So 
So this is a good practice. It's a good skill to develop. It requires that you invest some of your goodness, but then it creates more possibilities for your goodness as well. It nourishes your goodness. There's a phrase in the Pali, I can't remember quite what the Pali words are, but it basically says that it's hard for someone who has no merit to do meritorious things. In other words, if you don't have any goodness at all, you can't invest it to create more goodness. Well, the fact that you're a human being means you have some merit, some goodness to you. So you bring that out and invest it in the practice, and you'll find that it grows. This is a practice that makes you a better person all around. And you have more goodness to share. So it's good to reflect on these, these points as you practice, so you can give yourself to it wholeheartedly. Because it's the kind of practice that responds to wholeheartedness. You give it all of your attention. all your powers of observation, all your goodwill. And you find that it benefits your whole heart.